Yes, here we go. Good morning. It's day two of AAAS. I think it's actually day three of the meeting, but this is the second day I'll be here. Yesterday we had a great session on exoplanets, which included some of the biggest names that I know in the field, uh, including my good friend Jada Arney and Courtney Dressing. Longtime viewers of this channel will remember sat right next to me at the test launch. Really fantastic people. But today we move into something that I've been very excited about lately, and that is SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. There's going to be a great session this morning on the search for life, both techno signatures and bio signatures and I think it's going to be really exciting. There are folks here from the SETI Institute and the Breakthrough Listen Project and there's even a talk today by UW's own Victoria Meadows who's the leader of the Virtual Planetary Lab, hands down the best astrobiology institute in the world I think. I've been surprised at how different this meeting is. The breadth makes it really fun. I've been learning lots of little things about a wide range of science. But the difference in format is also really interesting. The lack of a lot of traditional posters means there's not a ton of one-on-one -on -one interaction with like junior scientists unless you find them in the hallways. I've been really impressed with the exhibition hall. And I think there's some really cool things we could take away from the AAAS meetings and bring to the AAAS meetings. One of the other interesting differences about this meeting uh, is it was scheduled to run Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Today, when I'm filming this, this is Saturday. And since it's happening at home, that means that uh, my kids are home and I'm not spending time with my family. So there's always a tension about when you host conferences. Should you try to overlap the weekends so that people have them free, especially people who are teachers or teaching faculty? But if you've got a family, weekends are a really bad time to take off because that's the time you spend with your family and with your kids. There's no perfect answer. And no matter what you choose, a weekend conference or a weekday conference, there's going to be a lot of tension with a large portion of people no matter what. So I kind of like that the AAAS split the difference and did two days on the weekdays and two days on the weekends. Honestly, I think that's a pretty good compromise. All right, coffee in a few minutes. Let's go. rovers uh, about 10 years or so ago. Last year we won the International Canadian Rover Challenge and that was the second year in a row coming in first place. Um, our rover is a smaller version of what you see going on Mars. Uh, we have a six axis arm, a full base chassis with a full e-box set up um, with full control uh, and along with a full science mission going on board. <laughs> It doesn't matter what convention center you're at, the staff are always very serious about the timeline. So the exhibition hall with the coffee doesn't open until 9.30 and they are not opening it a minute early. It's okay, they're professionals, they're doing their job. 9.30 exactly. I love the alien inside of the mech robot thing, that's awesome. So behind me is the tech tangle area, which is like a battle robot arena except for they're Mars rovers and they don't seem to be weaponized at all. So I have seen very little robot carnage, which is probably a good thing. What I saw was all the competing teams seemed to actually just be visiting with each other, repairing things and doing obstacles. It's much less battle robots and much more like what you expect to see at a science conference. It was cool. Speaking of aliens, the uh, SETI session starts in 20 minutes. Time to go upstairs. I also decided to leave my laptop at home today so my backpack is nice and light, but I feel weirdly vulnerable, like I don't have my laptop, what if I need to do work? It's Saturday, I don't need to do any work. I like this format, we don't use this usually at the AAS meetings with, with the big tables and a big lecture hall, it just kind of acknowledges that people are going to use their laptops. Why make them stuff themselves into little rows, just provide them tables, I like this. One of the things about doing SETI with large surveys like LSST and big data kinds of data sets is that it merges, I think, two of the biggest interests and strengths that the UW Astronomy Department has, astrobiology and data analysis and software. What's going to be awesome about this session is it's got talks both from the traditional SETI side and the astrobiology side. I, I think it's very rare to see those camps come together in the same venue. And as I said at ABSICON a few months ago, 
I'd be really curious to see how this room fills up and what the dynamic from the community is, if the community is interested in SETI as a, as a scientific discipline. It's going to be interesting. And ask themselves the question, are we alone here in the universe? Uh, it is an interesting question, it is a scientific question, and you'll hear about some of that today. Uh, it's been a quarter century uh, since we detected the first uh, planet around a, a solar-like star. And since that time, there's been amazing advances in technology and uh, amazing results obtained. Uh, we're at a point now where there are 4,000 or so planets uh, detected around nearby stars. There's exchange of material uh, between planetary systems. Uh, just a, a couple of years ago, we detected the first uh, interstellar object, uh, Oumuamua, which got quite a lot of press uh, for um, its, its possibility of being a, an alien spaceship. Uh, we now don't, don't think that it's a, an alien spaceship. Um, our latest scientific results in a, a paper led by a graduate student at Penn State, Sophia Shake, uh, she performed a, a survey of stars in something called the Earth Transit Zone, uh, the part of the sky where other stars could see our planet pass in front of the sun. Uh, and that paper has just been uh, submitted to the Astrophysical Journal and will show up on the archive, I believe, this afternoon. Uh, we also announced a, a new partnership with our friends at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory to bring the search for extraterrestrial intelligence to perhaps one of the telescopes that's most identified with the search, uh, but not used uh, so much for it, uh, the Jansky Very Large Array, which of course, as many of you know, featured um, very heavily in the, in the movie Contact. So I'm an astrobiologist. Um, we are not, uh, in this case, in the talk I'm talking about, we're not looking for little green men, we're looking for little green pond slime. And so I will talk to you about how we might even be able to do that over distances of parsecs. In our case, what we're doing is focusing on the, the impact of microbial life on the environment. I mean, in that case, our access for increasing our probability is time. Uh, because microbial life uh, dominated the environment of our planet for billions and billions of years before we upstart humans appeared at this very last little slice here. So, so with our search uh, for, for what we call biosignatures, we are trying to look at uh, an inhabited planet throughout all of its different, uh, different types of biospheres and increase our chances that way instead of relying on the, the probability, which may be rare, that in fact technological civilization uh, evolves. Okay, so Andrew mentioned Carl Sagan in his talk, and uh, Carl told us that extraordinary claims demand extraordinary evidence. And Vicki has just told you about the ways that the um, astrobiologists are planning to look for extraordinary evidence of biosignatures. But what about technosignatures? What about intelligent life? There was just a huge uh, fuss about these absolutely, obviously hoaxed data. And so we got ourselves together and we tried to um, come up with something that would be like the Richter scale. We developed something called the Rio scale, and it's been modified one, once or twice. It, even though it was in place, it did not protect us from 2016, which is the year that the media discovered ET, right? We had a claim that around Voyage and Star, there was perhaps the building of megastructures to block the light. Um, there was a claim in a paper that 234 alien civilizations were broadcasting bright optical pulses, very short. They all had exactly the same duration. And lastly, in that year, um, we had a claim that from a large radio telescope in Russia, um, there was the detection of a signal. Look, that's how I spent 2016, but ET was the wrong answer for these claims, right? Better answers, for example, for Bayajan star, uh, a warped thin disk of dust uh, for the Bore, Bora and Trottier pulses, not alien transmitters, but the processing of taking the Fourier transform of a spectra produced artifacts. And lastly, that Russian signal, where they saw it once when they looked at that star, but not the other 38 times they looked at that star, um, a military satellite is, is a better explanation. As to be expected, it's been a very interesting day. But it's also been a little bit surprising. 
So the morning started out with a great session on the search for life in the universe, technosignatures, biosignatures, SETI, one of my favorite topics in astronomy right now. And I'm really happy to report that the room was, uh, was quite full. The audience was great. And I think like it seemed like 20% of the audience was science journalists. So, so there must have been like something exciting there, hopefully for the broader public. And then my day has taken kind of a wonderfully unexpected turn. Yesterday, I visited the UW booth. There's a big University of Washington booth here at AAAS. And I asked the question, we had the AAAS meeting here just over a year ago. Why didn't we have a great UW booth? And the answer seems to be that the UW press people, people who would be responsible for putting that kind of booth together, uh, they didn't really know about the meeting until it was happening. This led me into a conversation today with James Erton, who is the press information officer for science and astronomy uh, at UW. So I am now so much better off for having met some of these press and media people that work at my institution. And then was able to have a chat with Rebecca Gourley, who is like the social media person. Like, it's perfect. Like, these are the people that I'm super excited to get to know. In the general sense, as an academic and as a scientist, we really like press and media coverage. It's validating for our work, and it's one of the most efficient ways to get the public aware of what we're doing. And it's also really good when you're trying to get jobs or go up for promotions or... Uh... And so by extension, knowing the media people, the people who craft the public face of the university, who worry about brand guidelines and logos by knowing them and being on good terms with them, that this will help my practice as a scientist and also as a science communicator. And so I'm really hoping, and they seemed open to the idea, to bring my camera to their office and getting their take on what a scientist needs to know about interacting with the press office at their university. So I think that'll be really cool content. Uh, and maybe they'll have some good tips for how to like make my audio and my lighting better in these videos. Okay, there's been a lot of good swag at the meeting, but I think we've got a strong contender for the best, or my favorite swag, which is the, the snap bracelet. Which I think actually is for bicycling, but I'm definitely gonna give it to my toddler to play with. Very fun. Come on, who doesn't love a friendly dinosaur?